It is a very difficult task to talk about issues about the Middle East because of the entrenched opinions, beliefs, not difficult tasks to talk about, but also the commentary and the opinions and the views shared on all sides, particularly in South Africa. We don't for once believe that we can change the world, but we do believe we can help each other understand the context of the past and history. My guest this morning is Daniel Levy. He's the president of the U.S. Middle East Project and was a senior advisor in the government of Ehud Barak, he was also a member of the official Israeli delegation to the Israel-Palestine peace talks at Taba. Um, this led to the Oslo B Accord. Remember, you had Oslo 1 and Oslo 2, a roadmap to peace which set out the boundary, the shared governance of Israelis and Palestine. This was in 1993 to 1995. We've moved so far away from the Oslo Accords. We ask where we are now and whether peace is attainable, whether peace is wanted by either side in the Middle East and whether there's political will from all parties to find a long-lasting truce. Daniel Levy, really appreciate your time and thank you so much for coming on to our show. Um, the questions that have dominated our phone lines here in South Africa, in Cape Town, is what is the appropriate or proportionate response by Israel to the October 7th attack by Hamas, which we also deplore and decry, but whether this is an appropriate question, should we be asking considering the plight and the ongoing plight of people of the West Bank and Gaza for the last, what, 75 years, Daniel? Good morning. Good morning, Lester, and it's good to be with you. And I think you pose an important question in the way you framed it, if I may say, because, of course, there's no making light of the horrendous nature of what happened on October 7th to Israelis. You also cannot pretend that history begins on October 7th and that things were okay on October 6th, the day before that attack, or that the party that happened to be attacked on October 7th, the Israeli side, then has free reign to act outside of the laws of international law, international humanitarian law, the Geneva Convention in its response. So unfortunately, of course, this isn't the first time civilians have been involved in the conflict. And I think the crucial thing is to hold those three thoughts simultaneously. First of all, no way to justify, excuse, accept the act perpetrated by the militants on the 7th of October. Yes, a people who lives under occupation with their rights denied has the right to resist, including armed resistance, but always within the parameter of international law. So that's the first thought, no excusing what happened. Secondly, that same stricture of operating within the law has to apply to what Israel does subsequently, and it is not being applied. Israel has cut off food, fuel, water, electricity, humanitarian supplies to the entire 2 million plus population of Palestinians in Gaza. It is bombing and killing civilians, 1,500 children. Just to kind of, I mean, it's horrendous to talk about any time, and your listeners, it's the morning, this is three times the number of children who have been killed in Ukraine. Mm. And this is just in two weeks. Mm. And thirdly, step back, understand the context, doesn't justify anything. But as you say, to ask some basic questions, mm. why are there so many Palestinians in this tiny strip of land called Gaza? You know, a lot of the reporting will talk about one of the most crowded, populated areas in the world. And there you understand that civilians have been part of this conflict from the get-go. 
1947 to 1949, when Israel is established, you have this mass forced displacement of Palestinians, many of whom are forced from southern Israel into that tiny area of Gaza. They have not been allowed to return, as you say, 75 years plus. And all this time, Palestinians have been stateless, lived without their basic rights and freedoms. They have no predictability to their daily life. They cannot move freely. They cannot leave. In the last 17 years, in Gaza specifically, the Palestinians have lived under a permanent siege. So if you were a kid born in Gaza when that siege began, you're almost finishing high school today. And unless you're in an exceptionally rare circumstance, you've never been allowed to leave Gaza. And so here's the question. What do you expect to happen? And again, it doesn't justify anything. But what do you expect to happen if you keep a people with no hope, no political horizon, no future that they can look forward to? And we kept telling policymakers, this is going to explode. And it's terrible when that happens. Daniel, 1993-1995 was this important process and period in South African history. It was also an important process and period in Middle Eastern history. The, the signing of the Oslo Accord, Oslo 1 signed in Washington, D.C., Oslo 2 signed in, in, in Egypt. It, it, it literally created a, a power and a governance sharing framework for the Middle East, Palestine and Israel, Jerusalem as a, a an independent international city and the various sharing of civil and security responsibilities. It was it was a plan that would set out in practice a peace deal for the Middle East. We're so far away from that now. The difference is between now and then, in 1993, there was something like 170 settlers, Jewish settlers in, in Palestinian territories. Now there are 500,000 Jewish settlers in Palestinian uh, 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 territories. Could we ever go back? Could we ever undo the wheel and reverse time and say, with what we have now, the reality of 500,000 Jewish settlers in Palestinian territories, could we ever go back to a period where we can say we can rework or we can relook at the Oslo Accords, which set out this roadmap for peace in the Middle East? Lester, it's it's really interesting that you you make that reference. That of course, in South Africa, in that same period in history, you went through a a, a transformation. You know, it was a it was a geopolitically important moment in history, which was common to everywhere. And therefore, I think it is interesting to look at what happened in the Israeli-Palestinian situation then, South Africa. There was, of course, at a similar time, a breakthrough in Northern Ireland as well. And it's this unipolar moment the the Cold War is over. The Soviet Union has collapsed. That has an impact. It had an impact in the situation in Southern Africa. It had an impact in Israel-Palestine. And I mentioned that in, in beginning to, to, to answer your question, because a lot of what has happened subsequently, of course, is down to the two parties. Israel's decision to increase fivefold, as you say, the number of illegal settlers in Palestinian territory. The fact that a deal which would have been very beneficial to Israel is one that Israel chose not to, uh, not to pursue, to not allow this Palestinian state to be established. But the other thing we have to remember is that for this to work, America, who really was the monopoly sponsor of the peace process and a hugely important ally to Israel, on which Israel is largely dependent, the United States of America needed to be the one in that unipolar moment to deliver Israel, to make sure Israel made good on its promises. And that didn't happen. Israel indulged, Israel was indulged rather by the United States. And, and these are the consequences. The other thing to say is, is directly to your question of, can we still go back to that deal? The idea that you can now separate into two states, 
looks increasingly impossible on the ground. I mean, if anyone were to go there, visit, you wouldn't know when you've crossed into the occupied West Bank. You'd know when you crossed into Gaza because you can't, because there, there was a, there's a huge fence around there that they managed to break through in, in conducting this, this uh, attack on October 7th. But you crisscross the West Bank and there's Israeli settlement after Israeli settlement. You'll tell which are the Palestinian villages uh, and towns because their conditions there are very different. They have no control over their own resources. Uh, they cannot develop their land. They cannot uh, externally trade any of these things. But we are at a place where it is unclear, I think, whether one can return to a possibility of separation, or one will have to reach a place, and maybe this is more necessary, it, it may sound a little crazy today to say this, but maybe it's more necessary after what happened to acknowledge that Jewish Israelis, Palestinian Arabs are here, they are going to have to accept the basic humanity of the other, live in equality, maybe have national rights, maybe have collective rights, but the situation is that, that there is a permanent structural violence underpinning the Israeli system. You cannot live without encountering the structural violence of the dominant occupying Israeli party in a deeply asymmetrical conflict if you are Palestinian. You live with that. People have made a legal analogy. It doesn't mean it's a one-to-one -one comparison mm. of exactly what happens in one and in the other. But in international law, the crime of apartheid is recognized. Mm. And the preeminent legal scholars and human rights organizations have looked at the situation of the Palestinians and said that this is, according to international law, a regime of, of apartheid being um, implemented by Israel. And so I think it's an open question, mm. but I do think we're, we're looking now beyond partition, given realities on the ground. If you look at why Oslo failed, uh, it was rejected by Israelis and Palestinians alike. Palestinians unhappy with the allocation and the division of of resources. Um, we saw the assassination of the Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin by right-wing hardliners with their disapproval of the signing of Oslo. So when we talk about getting the buy-in from the people, or Israelis, and people who are Palestinians, and it won't be a perfect 50-50 split of shared division of resources and land and water, etc. But how do you get the buy-in of Israeli citizens and people of the West Bank and Gaza saying, if we want a shared future, and this is what we've largely had to come to terms with in South Africa, a compromise agreement may not be totally happily with the compromise of 1994, but that is at least something that we have agreed upon to move slowly, hopefully but surely, to a process of permanent peace and permanent prosperity for all who live in this country and for all who live in the Middle East, Daniel? Lester, it's a, it's a good point. If, if I can very briefly take us back and then and then bring us to where we are again now. The, the deal on offer in Oslo, first of all, Israelis have been used to not having to compromise with the Palestinians at all. But there had just been a, a popular uprising, an intifada, and the, the occupation was beginning to impose a cost and the international community had reacted to that intifada and, and the Israeli uh, very visible aggression. And so for the Israeli side, they weren't really used to having to um, make that compromise. For the Palestinian side, the compromise on offer was a mini state in just 22% of the historic land and without addressing the fate of those refugees who were forcibly displaced that I mentioned earlier. So it was a hard compromise, but the publics did go with it not overwhelmingly. I think much more support on the Palestinian side and the leadership was carrying their people with them, always very divided on the Israeli side. What you have to do is show results. And there was a five year interim period 
Many of us thought even that was too long. And as that went on, and as you didn't see results on the ground, and actually you saw continued Israeli colonization, you saw some violent responses, the support ebbed away, as you say, the Israeli prime minister was assassinated. So I think there are lessons here. You move fast, you change realities, and you make them irreversible, and you let people see the benefits. Almost a quarter of a century later, of, of people retreating back into the, the dehumanization comfort zone, that is so much more difficult. And so I think to, to answer your question, it requires a lot from the inside. We haven't seen that kind of leadership. I must say the Palestinian and the Palestinian national movement has been divided. You see, after a long process, the division set in. So you don't have a strong Palestinian national movement anymore. Mm which makes it easier for the Israelis to play in those divisions. Mm. The Israelis became complacent and hubristic that they could keep things like this. That, in a terrifying way, blew up in their face on October 7th, and, and it was clear that something would eventually blow up in their face. And finally, you need the outside to help with an incentive structure that encourages progress and holds parties accountable when there is slippage. Mm. And what we saw from the outside was the exact reverse of that. And it applies to the power asymmetry mm. because Israel was treated, unlike South Africa, with impunity. And whatever Israel did to the Palestinians, led by the Americans, mm. The international community, the West, in fact, let them get away with it. Mm. And we see that on steroids today. And I think a lot of the world is looking at this and saying, wait a minute. You guys have been preaching to us, America, Europe. You have been telling us for the last 18 months, international law is sacrosanct. We are the ones who uphold the rules-based order. And here, when Gaza is being destroyed and children are being killed, and the Palestinians have been stateless and kept under occupation illegally for 75 years. You're, uh, you're supporting the Israeli side? Wait, what the hell's going on? What's going on? I think everyone's got whiplash. We, we're speaking to Daniel Levy. He's the president of the U.S. Middle East Project. is also one of the advisors under a former Israeli government and one of the negotiators during the Oslo Peace Accords. I ask you this question, Daniel. Is there a vacuum of moderate, measured, and peace-seeking leadership in Palestine and in Israel? At the end of the day, does this fall to the voters of Israel? to make an informed decision at the next national elections? Does this leave the voters of Gaza, which voted in Hamas as a political leadership, does it fall to them to seek and to demand a moderate, measured and peace-seeking leadership to provide direction for a lasting truce in Israel and Palestine? So let's unpack that. The Palestinian national movement has been divided and the outside, the West, encouraged and nurtured that division. Israel, of course, led the nurturing of that division because that's what you do when you're trying to keep people without their rights. You play divide and rule. Shame on the Palestinian leadership that they fell into that trap. So we haven't had Palestinian elections since 2006. The, the national institutions are collapsing and you need that national unity on the Palestinian side to have a strategy, etc. On the Israeli side, I would simply say this. Nobody operates in a total vacuum. So if the Israeli voting public at one stage thought, you know what? We may not like the Palestinians. We may not like the concessions we have to make in a possible peace, but our lives will be better. Look at all these costs if we don't make peace. We better support the people who are advancing peace because we face sanctions, we face uh, economic costs if we don't. And at one point, the Israelis actually just about mustered a majority to think that way. Years and years and years later, 
when they've said, wait a minute, there's no cost. If we keep the Palestinians living this way, it's fine. Our economy booms. Arab states make peace with us. States, the Americans guarantee that it's all okay. The lessons learned are the wrong lessons. So what I'm saying is, yes, it's up to Palestinians and Israelis, but they don't live in isolation. They live in a context. And that context is not exclusively their own making, just as in South Africa, that context is impacted by the outside. And the outside, sadly, sadly, led by the US, has done a terrible disservice, of course, to Palestinians, but I would also argue to rational Israeli decision making. Uh, Daniel Levy, that's all we have time for. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for providing the history and the context and possibly a route forward to this very important conversation. Daniel Levy is the president of the U.S. Middle East Project, also a former negotiator in the Israeli government during the Oslo Peace Accords. Really appreciate your time.